Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tales from the Fog. I am your host, Casey, and with me, as always, is the amazing and wonderful Veronica. How are you doing? You know what? I'm pretty high on life right awesome. now. Awesome. Yeah. But what's making you high on life? Well, um, yesterday and today, I guess, um, I went to a sort of follow-up to an audition that I was talking about that happened about three or four weeks ago with Action Horizons, and um, still just riding the high from that whole experience. So so the one for this this past time was for Waterworld. Correct. At Universal Studios. I say yesterday and today because I took two days off of work to go to audition, <laughs> so it's a CMA sort of situation. But um, yeah, so this was for the Waterworld show. The prior audition was encompassing several different performances that they do. This one was for one thing, and they made it pretty clear at the beginning that we're not really looking to cast someone who's going to play a full-time whatever. They have that. They need backups. They need understudies. They need subs. They need that kind of thing. Yeah. So there wasn't any false pretense. We Mm -hmm. knew that no one was, you know, unless they really shined out, I imagine they leave that door open for themselves. This was just to go in and show them what she got. Yeah. So it was uh, very similar to last time. I had heard in the past, and with these things, it's all hearsay and rumors, and, oh, well, my friend told me this, my buddy told me that. So that's all anyone had to work on. Now that it's done, the physical assessment was exactly the same as last time. So if you had gone to the last auditions, you were very comfortable going into these auditions. Yeah. It was nice. So uh, the order was a little bit different this time. Uh, This time I started out with the minute plank, then went into a minute of burpees, and then a minute of... uh, it's like stair step. It's like jazzercise, but the step's like maybe 18 inches off the ground, one of those plyo boxes. Okay, yeah. And you have to stand up on it with both feet. Like so, step one and then have both feet up on the platform, step down, both feet on the floor. So at the same time. You like alternate, jump yeah. Up. yeah. You don't jump up. You have to step up. Oh, so it's like step up. Yeah, it's step not. Up, it wasn't up, a plyo exercise. Okay. It was a stepping exercise, which yeah, is yeah. great because they always butt it up against a mirrored wall. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people miss that step and hit the wall and hit the mirror. <laughs> and like, you just don't want that to be you. Yeah. So uh, st- uh, station three was the step up. Station four was pull ups. And then station five was the shuttle run, which is about, uh, I don't know, 30 feet. 30 Mm -hmm. or 40 feet. I'm not good at judging distances, but it's a a bit of a jog to one end. You hit the ground, touch your chest to the ground, stand up, and then run back to the other side and do the same thing on the other side. One mark counted as going out and back. Okay. So that was the order that I took the obstacles this time around. Before, it was the same order, but um, I started with pull-ups. So comparing the two, much easier to do pull-ups as your first obstacle than your fourth. Yeah. But you're nice and warmed up and super jazzed about having done the hardest part of the obstacles that when you get that far, you kind of feel like you can give it everything. You don't have to hold anything back for later obstacles. That's true. So, you know, pros and cons to both. Last time I did my max was six pull-ups, which probably sounds pretty sad to anyone who does any working out. But for me, it was pretty monumental because I got a big butt and I have to lift it up in the air. So doing six pull-ups is something that I was pretty proud of. Currently, my max pull-up is a 0.25. For some perspective. (laughs) (laughs) So, but this time around, I, for the first time in my life, I did seven pull-ups in the minute span. Yeah. And, you know, again, seven pull-ups doesn't sound like very much, but I'm new to this whole obstacle training working out thing and seven pull-ups was pretty monumental for me that's awesome and You're just paring all over the place yeah <laughs> i'm taking it you know kind of seriously yeah i guess you could say because now not it anymore. i don't know if, if those of you that follow me on social media at tales from the fog you probably saw the video of veronica hitting eight feet uh which is her personal record which is basically a new female distant record but we don't really count distant records if they're not done in a show which seems kind of silly if you've got documentation it should count but it is what it is perhaps midsummer scream 2018 you might see a new female record well the goal is at minimum seven bodies yeah this year the record stands at six the record prior to that stands at five and we already have both of our female jumpers in the decade brigade jumping at least five so we're already 
the best that has been yet. Yeah. Which is great. And now we're starting off. We haven't even officially started the season yet. And Ducky is doing phenomenal already. But she's been training also year round. Yes. And then, you know, getting to eight feet this early in the season. You know, like there is a possibility of peaking too early in the season. But we don't practice that often. And I don't see either of us peaking at any point because we're not progressively pushing our training towards that goal. Mm-hmm. I think that we, if we gave it more time, we probably could. We could, you know, be a little bit more scientific about how we train to get to peak at the end of July, early August. Yeah. We just don't think of it that way in this application yet. So we're just pushing ourselves as hard as we can go. And eight feet, it's again, like if you're a long jumper, eight feet's not that long. It's actually kind of a shorter. Jump. It's kind of sad. <laughs> yeah. It's a, if a little kid jumped eight feet, I'd be super happy for him. But a, a grown ass person jumping eight feet is like meh. But when you're jumping from a hands and knees position, having run up to your approach is, you know, kind of a weird, fun skill to have. Yeah. And the fact that we're yeah. already, you know, setting new marks for ourselves is promising for this year. And I have a new PR slider jump at six feet. That's my personal record, which is great. I mean, that's a that was for an the old record. school slider like me. That would have been phenomenal back in the early two thousands. Like a six foot jump would have been like holy shit. There's a now it's like meh. <laughs> but you're also practicing with the best of the best. I yeah, mean, these guys and gals are very talented, very dedicated to physical training, and you can tell. The results are definitely there. Mm-hmm. But we were we were talking to Paul Verschett about this. He was saying, like, the distance record, how long it was and how long it had gone undefeated with yes. the, the nine bodies on the floor. So me, as a woman, we have a harder time physically doing this sport. The, the goal of seven bodies being just too shy of the male record that was for so long. Yeah, that is, stood for a decade or more. Yes. Yeah. Like, that's unheard of. That means with continued training, potentially a woman could match that, could mm-hmm. have the record that was once held by a man. Yes. Would be mind blowing. <laughs> if any, and I, I want that to be me, but I'm not counting on it being me. It could be anybody. Mm-hmm. But I really want it done. And I think the nine stood for so long simply because the equipment didn't allow like the equipment that we have now is so much better so much faster Mm -hmm. you know it's it's just developed so much more yeah i think that's when the record finally broke and our technique improved as well yeah because we're focusing our training on specific things like specific uh stunts so there is a very distinct workout that will train the muscles that you use to jump for distance and that's if you that's what you focus on, you're gonna get that distance. You might not be as agile in other maneuvers, you may not be as flexible if you're not concentrating on that. But there is a way to train in a weight room just to distance jump. Yes. And actually, I mean, that's how Double D kept his record and pushed it and pushed it, was because he focused his training on getting stronger in a way that would make him a better distance jumper. So what what's the current male? Is it twelve or thirteen? It's twelve. It's twelve. Yeah, which is hilarious because when Double D jumped 10, we lost our minds. Yeah. And then he jumped 11 and we lost our minds. And, and then two jumpers jumped 12 and we all collectively lost our minds again. Yeah. So you think 13 this year? I've seen James train. Yeah. I've seen how hard he works. I've seen how dedicated he also, is. Also, if you've seen my feed on Instagram, you would have seen a new trick we've been working on, which is spins Mm -hmm. in the air distance jumping and he did a he did a 360 over about a four four and a half foot jump i Mm -hmm. think but he cleared eight feet doing a 180 yeah which is insane (laughs) it is insane and we have other members of the team who can physically pull that off but it's doing it consistently and being able to add enough pizzazz to it to possibly put it in a show but yeah, because that's the thing is you don't want to hurt the people lying down. So you have to be able to nail it you every have to be time. Consistent. And you have to make it look harder than it is. Yeah. But and this is one of those tricks that is as hard. It's harder than you think it is. Yeah. Because it doesn't look very showy, but it takes everything to get distance and aerial rotation. Yeah. And land where you're supposed to land and not land on a and shoulder. And out of, 
God, I don't I can't even think of he tried it at least twenty times and he landed it once. That's and he was gonna idea. give up too, and I was like, No, dude, you're no. so close. One more time, one more time, just do it. You could do it and bam, he nailed it. If you hadn't told him that, time. he would have told himself that. Because yeah. he's the kind of kid that he doesn't take no for an answer. But he, he's usually the one telling himself no. But then he'll follow it up with, No, that's that's not how it works. Mm-hmm. We're gonna keep going well, until he we was get it. Obviously tired. He'd done it like nineteen times before. It's a lot of ex- exertion. Every body. yeah, every time yeah. and he jumped, just had a major harder. wipeout too, where he just like when he landed, he just full body oh, hit man. the ground, and he doesn't wear thing. any padding other than a sliding gear. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I wanted him to end on a good note, not a bad note. So I forced him to do one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's been pushing it really hard, and I think that's that's his game that he plays. Yeah, that's the fun is. Well, we can do this. How about this? So that That's what's pushed the sport along this far anyway. Like, wouldn't it be really stupid if, and then you do you try to do the thing, it doesn't execute well, but you, it looked kind of cool. You're like, I see what you did. I'm going to add this. And it yeah. just keeps building and building. He's in that creative mind space where he's building new tricks. Mm-hmm. That's always an asset to have. But yeah, he's super strong. And all of that was to say, I think he'll jump 13 this year. I think he will too. As long as he can... Keep his hands up. He likes to hit the ground hands to like first. to. Well, you want to land hands first, yeah. but like he kind of second guesses himself and ends up kind of doing a quick little booty tap to whoever he just jumped over. Mm-hmm. But he, once he has faith in that jump and it's consistent in practice, I don't see him doing that smack. Yeah, to try to, he almost like tries to vault to get a little bit more distance, and it's I think it's kind of a natural response because when you're in the air coming down. You want to put your hands down as quickly as you can. But you need to wait. It's waiting, letting yeah. letting the physics do its magic, letting your trajectory go over, extending your hands past what your you know past your landing point. And like we've talked about so many different times, with your center of gravity does not have to be above, be past the people you're jumping in order for you to land a jump, as long as your hands are extended in front of you. Mm-hmm. So that's his that at least from the outside looking in that's. Seems to be where he is right now on top of building tricks. Yeah. But we're all in that mindset now. Like we're building our next shows for summer. Starting this Sunday. Yeah. So we're starting to get really excited again. Like it's coming around again already. (laughs) It's awesome. Yeah. Um, Well, let's just keep on talking to Cade Brigade. So we had a kind of secret show, which isn't really secret anymore, (laughs) uh, last Friday. Mm -hmm. And it was for um, elementary school to kick off their reading month reading week reading something it's i think it's dr seuss week or dr seuss month well it's just reading month yeah but but this but year that week specifically was because dr. it's dr seuss seuss's week. anniversary mm-hmm. um coming up it was a special dr seuss week and so we kicked off the, the week which was going to start on monday mm-hmm. um that friday by doing an awesome assembly for 750 kids And we put on a slider show called Slide Into Reading, and it featured uh, the Cat in the Hat, Thing One, Thing Two, The Grinch, Curious George, Mm -hmm. The Hungry Caterpillar, uh, a couple wizards from Hogwarts, and and Ducky as a little girl who (laughs) who created who wrote a book and was reading it the whole time about how all these characters got together and had fun. Um, So damn cute. (laughs) Yeah. So what was you from a performer point of view? How, what did you think of the show? I think it went really well for a first show. Um, it wasn't our first rodeo as far as sliding, but this was our first time doing something where we were not scary monsters. Yeah. I mean, us collectively as the Decade Brigade, we individually, I'm sure, have done performance art in some way where we had to portray a character and interact with an audience member that didn't have anything to do with sliding or scaring. <coughs> but this was the first time that we as a group had done that. And it snuck out a little bit. I saw in a couple of people that they wanted to scare because that's just where you go. But then they pulled it back pretty quickly and no little kids got scared. No, well, that's not true. <laughs> so the, the way the kids move around the school is they, there's a kid out of the classroom at some point, pretty much all day. All time. Yeah. No Either they're what. using the restroom or they're going to recess, going to lunch, PE, Whatever it is, they're out there and they can see you. So we're in there 
we got there super early to get our makeup done and everything. So a couple of us have full makeup on and go outside to where we think our area should be clear. And it's not clear. And there are kids there. <laughs> yeah, because we were told specifically, don't go out till this time. Then the playground's going to be empty. You can set up everything. And the kids will come out at this time. So we're like, all right, it's time. We roll all our stuff out there and an entire playground filled with kids. <laughs> On our staging area as yeah. well. Like the whole runway is covered with children. <laughs> we're like, oh. And I guess one kid saw Trey with his, his monkey makeup and was like, oh. Uh, just <laughs> so visually stunned by like what what am i looking at yeah out of context some of those characters could be a little scary yeah the monkey could be yeah. a little scary i mean any of them if you just saw a character especially if you've ever seen like the batman with the, the creepy ass joker like who's this guy with makeup on their face walking around my school not the best climate especially to be doing right that. after certain yeah. events <laughs> <laughs> not a good idea on the surface. So we took extra precautions not to come off like that. Yeah. We, we, we are not those people. But it was fun, like, running to the adult restroom because you can't use the kids' restroom because there's kids in there all the time. And trying I – mean, you go in one at a time and we're all huddled together for warmth because it was a cold, windy day. Half of us have makeup on and we're trying to hide our faces from the kids at PE running their <laughs> mile laps. Oh, it was pretty fun. But yeah. my favorite part of the show – was the little kids who are in the first three rows that were sitting down, reaching their hands out to high five the sliders as they went by? Yeah, that, that like cool. it got me in a way that oh, it was it was really special. Like we were, we had captivated them. We had their undivided attention. Mm -hmm. For a little kid, it's difficult to do for longer than ten minutes. We had them the whole show. And after. Right? And after they wanted to take pictures with us and they were asking us about our costumes and like they wanted us back. They wanted pictures with us. A couple of the savvy ones were saying what our YouTube link was. Yeah. Creeped me out. I'll tell you what. But like fourth grade, they know what YouTube is. Xander's in second grade. He knows what YouTube is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the highlight was watching the kids watch us and want like the reaching out of the little hands. Yeah. Was. Ugh. I think the funniest thing is we design the shows, you know, all our shows are basically designed more for adults. And we, being adults, have a really good idea of how people will react to certain things throughout the show. Because we're like, oh, if we do this, they're going to understand this or they're going to react this way. And we have a good, pretty good idea of, of what's going to happen. When you have 750 kids, like... They were reacting to stuff that we didn't plan mm -hmm. at all. Yep. So there was a part where, like, we did a we did like a real limbo competition, which we haven't done in a show in a long time. Mm -hmm. But a real limbo competition, you can only go under the limbo bar. You can't go over it. You can't go on the side of it and do a trick. You have to go under the limbo bar. If whatever you do misses, you either knock it off or you go over the limbo bar or whatever, you're out and you're done. Like, and then the rest of the people keep going and whoever's left last is the winner. So we, we actually staged stuff on purpose because we're like, oh, this will be funny. So like we had one of the wizards from Hogwarts slide up and use his wand and we had like fishing string on the, on the pole and we raised it and he just walked under it and then we put the wand down. <laughs> now every, we were like, oh yeah, it'll be like a funny little bit. The kids went crazy and were yelling that he cheated and we should have called him out. <laughs> 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 then we had James who loves to jump. We're like, okay, because we knew everybody could do most of the limbo. The section, we had to fit it in a certain time. So we knew we had to get people out just to get the show going. So we had James at one point. We're like, okay, you're going to jump over the bar and then we're going to call you out. So he jumps over the bar, I call him out. And then all the kids are yelling at me <laughs> for calling him out because he did this really cool trick. <laughs> They were all, and it was the first time we had seen a big jump yet in the show. Yeah. So he comes over, jumps on the bar, and the kids, that was, I think, the first time when they lost it. Yeah. And they were like, whoa! And then when you blew the whistle, they were like, hey! <laughs> they got so mad at you. They did. They got really mad at you. <laughs> but once that happened, we had them. Yeah. They were into everything. Suddenly, everything was magic. Except first, the music is, you know, we're, we're, exhibition storytelling we're setting the scene introducing the characters 
like they have no reason to root for any of us yet. Mm -hmm. Once that happened and like the competition element presented itself, we had them all. Yeah, because then they were like siding with certain people like that's Mm -hmm. the one I want to see do the best. Yeah. And they started cheering for the people that they liked and everything. Yeah, it was crazy. It turned into something otherworldly. And then the first time, like I've never heard – I can only assume it's like what it's like when you're a rock star and you walk out on the stage for the first time and then the crowd just goes nuts. Like the very first time when they jumped – I think it was when you guys jumped three people. Mm -hmm. The amount of noise – of cheering and stuff that came out of 750 kids was just like <laughs> ear deafening. And all of the teachers yeah. and the parents who showed up and the people from the district who showed up. Everyone there was floored by what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Three bodies, three people on the floor. Yep. That's nothing to us. But to them, it was, it might as well have been Circus Soleil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. So, all that being said, I think it went off really well. Yeah. The We already have another school that is interested in the show. Um, so it may end up being a continuing touring show to elementary schools around the Southland. <laughs> and a colleague of ours from Scary Farm that I've known for, oh my God, like 15 years now, sent us a message and asked us like, hey, were you at this school? My kids go there. Yeah. <laughs> my kids saw your show. So somebody that I hold in very high regard as a very talented slider and monster, legendary monster. Yeah. His kids were there to watch us slide and do the thing that their dad used to do. Mm-hmm. Like that was, that kind of brought it around full circle. Yeah. It's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty we cool. That. It was fun. It came together great. I hope the makeup artists had fun. By looking at our makeup jobs, it looks like they had fun. Yeah. Like the, the makeup was amazing. The Grinch was amazing. Grinch the, stole the show, although the cat in the hat was. Cat in the hat was super. really good. God, the thing one and thing two were awesome. So cute. They turned out so cute. I do think if we Curious George needs a little bit more of a cartoony yeah. thing to it. It was a little too realistic, I think. It looked beautiful, but it yeah. was a little scary. But that may not be the the makeup job itself it could just be the prosthetic i think yeah that's what i mean like we need like a custom prosthetic that's more cartoony yeah something that's more like curious george eyes smooth lines yeah big cheekbones yeah or big puffy cheeks Mm -hmm. that kind of thing something much more cute as opposed to realistic yeah but it looked but it looked awesome (laughs) yeah and the kids got like once like they're like oh he's curious george then Mm -hmm. it's like they weren't scared of him anymore and the spin and a hop. Yeah. And the way he always does it where he spins and he hops at the perfect time and it's just in line with the music. Oh, mm-hmm. so good. I don't think there was anything that went catastrophically wrong that uh, I can think of. The book fell apart in, just in time. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> it fell at apart as end. she was reading like the end and closes the book and then the book fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it lasted uh, as long as it needed to. I think other than the wind and it being cold. That were like, some obstacles, yeah. Yeah. The wind was difficult because of all that pipe and drape. It was cold. It was very cold. I blew through my shoelaces. Yep. Which I didn't expect, but we were practicing on what is essentially sliding glass at mm-hmm. the rink where your shoelaces are probably going to last a little longer. We're out there on blacktop with four square paint on it. Yeah. So I didn't. My shoelaces right, did not right survive. Through. So the photo ops after the show, I have no shoes on <laughs> because I had no way of quickly securing them in a way that would keep them on my feet while I was bebopping around all over the place. I'm like, you know yeah. what? A thing probably goes around without shoes on. So I, took I would think shoes. so. They seem like hippies. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredibly fun. So that's the idea behind the slide into reading thing is to hopefully get a sort of um, and like an imagination station, imagination machine, I forget the name of it, but they, it's like a performance group that tours schools, holds assemblies and teaches some kind of lesson, tells some yeah. kind of story. And the goal for this project is to do that, but with sliding, yeah, getting kids interested about... in physical fitness and, and telling a story in your own head, acting it out, letting it. Yeah. About being creative. Yeah. Letting that story take you over for a minute and just like surrendering yourself to those stories. Mm-hmm. I hope that makes it a cross. It's not just a bunch of weird prosthetic and then people doing stunts. You know, I hope they could see the the intended layer 
of yeah. what we're doing. And you know the school does, or else they wouldn't have asked us back. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, oh, that was cool. All right. But, you know, they don't know what we're about. If the, whatever message we were trying to tell didn't come across, like, there are plenty of reasons for them not to want us back. We ate an entire classroom for the whole day. We, you know, had a lot of equipment. We had a lot of people. We had a big staff with us that day. Yeah. It was probably administration administration wise it was kind of a pain in the ass, but they did it for us. Well, it's less. I mean, it, yeah, it's less than some shows. Like there's the BMX skateboard stunt people that travel around. They have like a freaking pack of 30, 40 people yeah. that put those shows together. And I remember when I was a kid, the knights from uh, Medieval Times came, horses and all, oh, and cool. did jousting at my school. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's that's a huge crew, I'm sure, as well. But then, on, you know, with all of that, they've got experience with it, but it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. But they were willing to let us at least show them what we got. And I think we did, and I hope it went well. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. And now I've got an awesome thing to costume. Yep. Um, what else did we do? Oh, so last time we told you that we were going to go on a little date. And so why don't you tell people about the cauldron? The cauldron was gorgeous. So we went to the cauldron as step one or yeah, step one on our date. And we saw people that we knew and we saw Laura there and, um, we had, I had a Bloody Mary and you had something with the gray witch. Did you yeah. have the gray witch? They were both delicious. I mean, I'm not a fancy drink drinker. I just More like of a beer. <laughs> I like I like beer. Um <clears throat> but I, but I love bloody marys. Yeah. And this bloody mary was pretty tasty. It did taste a little different. Not entirely sure it was vegetarian. Well, it was a smoking hot maria is what they call it. It was good. It was yeah. spicy. It was flavorful. It did taste kind of bacony or something like there was maybe well, a meat sauce they in there, put, but they put, I think since it's called smoking hot, I think it said they add smoke to it or something. Okay. Which so I've seen them do that in Bloody Marys before. They like have this thing that they stick on top and they actually pump smoke into mm. the mix. So it's not like liquid smoke. No. Like that really smoky liqueur. That. No. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. That stuff's gross. <laughs> that was gross. I don't have a grown up taste for that kind of thing. But um, they were really good. And then we had an appetizer. We got those little, um, they're like little biscuits, but with cheese flavor in cheese them. Cheese puffs. The cheese puffs. And I kept thinking, oh, my spinach puffs. <laughs> but they were good. Smaller than I would have liked, but they were very tasty. Yeah. The problem is, is they have no vegetarian food there. No. So, you know, maybe it'd be cool if they added at least something on there that's vegetarian. They seem at the point where suggestions like that may be welcome. Yeah. You know, they're still brand new, but as far as I can tell, they're very successful. Yeah, they seem to be pretty busy. And we have I friends so. that work there, and I always ask them, like, is it still doing good? And they're like, yeah, it's busy all the time. So they That's have a cool. patio now. They had, like, apparently they just opened when we went. Oh, really? Jeremy that was, was new? Jeremy was saying That's new. Yeah. Oh. So there's, like, a little patio out front mm-hmm. where you can hang out. That's neat. The place is – it's an interesting location. And I was kind of wondering how it would do. But where it is and what it is, it does work. It works out being where it is. And once you go inside, it is just gorgeous in there. Yeah, and I think come haunt time, it's going to be packed. It'll be packed, yeah, for people before they go like in. pre-gaming to go to Scary yeah. Farm. And then when they leave Scary Farm, yeah. I think they're going to go, they're going to head right over there. And that'll be a lot of fun. It's beautiful. I mean, some of Laura's artwork is up. Just bookcases and really interesting chandeliers and the tables and the way they present their, their food and drink. It's all gorgeous. I mean, I know nothing about... Like restaurant stuff, but for me, not knowing anything and just being, you know, into that funky antique kind of look, this place definitely has it. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, I like the little fireplace area. It's mm-hmm. very nice. It's very intimate. Yeah, it's pretty small inside, but it's that we could see. There was apparently some speakeasy room that people were going in and out of that were part of a party the night. That yeah, we went. it's like a party area that you can rent or something yeah but it's hidden behind the bookcase so you have to be escorted back there yeah that was a nice touch yeah it's pretty cool yeah and i guess the dudes from sinister point did some of the decorating in there yeah i don't know exactly what everything i'm assuming like probably the fireplace and the video 
there's like a mirror above it that's actually like a video monitor of some kind. They oh. probably did that. Because it's very close to the kind of thing that they did for their uh, Bloody Mary mm-hmm. haunted house. Neat. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a good good pre-adventure pit stop. Yeah. yeah. And then after the cauldron, we went and did the Void, uh, Secrets of the Empire Star Wars Virtual Reality Experience. Yeah. That's <laughs> a mouthful. <laughs> Is that really what it's called? Yeah. Oh, man. Secrets of the Empire uh, Star Wars Virtual Reality Experience. Okay. Whatever. That's the full name. I think it's just called Secrets of the Empire, but people would be like, what's that? Like, it, oh, it's a Star Wars thing and it's virtual reality. Yeah. And it is an experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, it was by far the best virtual reality thing I've done. Yeah. Yeah. What made it, what, what made it stand out? Um, I loved kind of just the pre thing, like, like I said, when we we're talking to Rick and Ted, when they were both on the podcast, like I like when people put a reason for getting into the gear and mm-hmm. a reason behind the event that's about to take place. Mm-hmm. And so in this one, um, the whole idea is, uh, God, what's his name from Star Wars? The, the spy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Naaman would know. Yeah, name it. <laughs> Go ahead and uh, post on the comments the name of the spy from Star Wars: The Last Jedi. We need to have him on as like our Star Wars correspondent. Yeah, <laughs> anytime we talk about Star Wars, <laughs> we'll have him on. Um, anyway, basically, he's trying to get this cargo. They don't know what's inside it, but it's some kind of weapon. And so your job is uh, to go undercover as a stormtrooper to find the piece of cargo. And and collect it and figure out what it is. Um, so basically, you're getting suited up, you know. And then once you're in the suit, you can actually look at your hands. Like your hands are tracked in <coughs> in virtual reality. So um, you can actually see your hands, and you have like the star uh, the the stormtrooper gloves on yeah. and the, the armor on, and that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. You can um, reach out and touch the walls and the the things that are with you in the room. Yeah. So anything that's in the virtual reality environment is also in the real world. So if you see a droid going through, you can actually touch the droid and it's really there. Mm -hmm. Um, If there's a door, it's really there. If there's a wall, it's really there. Um, So everything's really, really cool. And uh, it's wireless. So you have like a backpack. They say the whole setup is 17 pounds. It didn't. Once you have everything on, it doesn't feel that heavy. It does at first. But when they first, they have them kind of suspended on these little bungees and you back up into the backpack and you put it on and then you clip all the things. And then when they and unhook you it, you it do up. feel that like, huh, like, oh, but then as soon as it's on, you're, yeah, you, you don't just notice accept it, it as part of all. you. Yeah. Um, so you start out and you're. We're going to spoil the crap out of this, by the way. So if you haven't done The Void and you don't want any spoilers, probably just fast forward, you know, a few minutes so you don't <laughs> get anything spoiled. So from here on out, we're spoiling the crap out of The Void. All right. So it starts out. Are you gone? I hope everybody's gone. <laughs> All right. So it starts out. You uh, are in a stolen Imperial transport ship. And you're loaded in and you're told to sit down on this bench. And that's like the first time. I think it's purposely done that way because it's like, you want me to do what? On this <laughs> fake on this fake seat over here? That we don't even know if it's really there. Yeah, enough. like you could just totally like fall on your ass on the ground, you know. But I think it was purposely done that way to get your mind into this is all real. You can trust what you, you see. Yeah, what you see, you can trust it's there. Um, so then you're told to sit down you sit down and the transport takes off and you're basically, they put a tracker on the cargo ship that's holding the cargo that you're after. So you're basically just chasing it through space. Um, and then you end up on Mustafar, which is Darth Vader's planet where he has his castle. Um, and... Is that where he gets all his boo-boos? Yeah. Okay. And that, yeah, that's where he originally got all fried. You were the chosen one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so 
so you fly in and then on the video screen, of course, the Imperial guys come on. They're like, we're going to check your shit uh, and make sure you, you can't bring any guns into the into the thing. So now you're, you when you leave the ship, you can't take your guns. So you're on your own. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, you don't have a weapon when you start. Yeah, you don't have a weapon, but basically it's it. they, you know, they're saying you have to sneak in to this place. And so they're like, oh, we're going to sneak into Darth Vader's castle without any guns. This yeah. is great. This is a great idea. Um, and then the, this is where you get the first really wow factor. So you exit the transport that you're in onto one of those amazing, like, floating uh uh, platforms that they use all over the Star Wars is, you know, movies and cartoons and stuff. And you're over the lava. You can feel the heat of the lava. And then the whole thing moves. And now the whole thing is moving you over the lava to the other side of the lava field to another platform. And that's like the first like wow factor. So you can look down and you get a little bit of a vertigo effect. Mm -hmm. There's no rails on this thing. you know. So if you reach out to try to touch like what you think the room boundary would be, there is no boundary there. Yes. It's like you could potentially fall so, off. So, yeah, in your brain you're thinking, holy crap, I'm over lava. There's no railing. This is the most unsafe thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Like and you your can brain look. is really processing it like it's real. Yeah. The way that the motion happens, I don't know how they get the floors to move, like what what mechanisms are in place, but it's com combined with that VR, it really feels like you're floating from your ship to yeah. the dock or wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. And you can look around and it looks like you're looking so far into the distance. Yeah. So then after that, basically you're working with, um, oh, I forgot to mention the other thing. Mm -hmm. K2SO is your pilot yeah. in the cargo transport ship. And he also is in comms with you the whole time. So you're hearing him through your helmet, basically, mm -hmm. telling you, what's going on. So he's basically giving you directions like the, the cargo thing is this way, go through this door. And then if a door, like sometimes you'll get stuck and the door's locked and he has to unlock it for you. Then the door opens and you can keep going. Mm -hmm. And um, so you're basically like sneaking in through these back alleys, through this Darth Vader's castle to find this thing. And eventually you come to a dead end and it's like an armory with all these guns on the wall and as soon as I saw the guns, I was like, hell yeah. And I just went and grabbed it. Like at that point, I was just like, like I know this is real. Yeah. And there's some guns there. I want a gun. And I'm going to shoot some stuff. <laughs> the trippy part was I was taking guns and handing them to the other two that were in our party. And the reaching for it, I went deliberately slow because I wanted to see in the animation my hand grabbing the gun. Yeah. And I wanted to feel it, the weight of it. And then I wanted to pass it off to somebody else. Like I wanted to see it in the headset, mm -hmm. what all that was and how it felt compared to that tactile feeling of holding the thing, the prop and handing it to the other person and the depth perception and everything. And it was all spot on. Yeah. It was perfect. Like if you grabbed the gun, like where the trigger is, you could, you grabbed the real gun where the trigger was. Yeah. Like everything was just mapped perfectly. And if you held it in front of you, it looked like a big ass weapon. But when you see it later, you see what it really looks like. And you're like, Oh, well, that's not what I pictured at all. <laughs> when did you see it later? When you, you can take off, your gear when you hand it at the very end. Oh, take see, off I your handed gear. my gun off before I took my helmet off, so I didn't, oh, I didn't see it. No, I took my helmet off first so I could see what the gun looks like. No, I didn't look oh, at it. So what did it look like in real life? It was like this – it's really hard to describe. It was like – it had a, a, a regular like pistol-style grip, and then it had like a, a bar – above it that came off and it was shorter than I thought, but there was a lot of weight at the front, which made it kind of match that. It looked like more like a rifle, yeah, like a laser rifle. Mm -hmm. So it would be very heavy at the front with all, with the barrel going out. But this thing, it stopped shorter than I thought. And it just looked like a, I don't know. It looked like a super soaker that had been flattened. Hmm. It was just like chambers. So did you see like any trackers on it? Like how it would be tracked in the environment? No, I didn't look at it that closely because mm. the lady was taking it away from me. But I wanted to make sure I got I got to see it yeah. and see what it looked like that I was holding. And I was like, oh, that is not at all what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know what to expect. I mean, and none of it needs to look like anything. Yeah. But it was it was cool. Um, so then once you have your gun, you go out and you go through another door and you end up on a little platform that's kind of overlooking another lava field. And that's when the first 
uh, stormtroopers realize that you're not really other stormtroopers and and shit starts to go down and mm-hmm. then there's like these lava monster things that are also attacking you so there's like these giant lava monsters coming out of the lava and then you have stormtroopers up on a higher platform than you shooting down at you mm-hmm. and so you're just like who do you decide to shoot and like you know you're just like going crazy shooting stuff and it was awesome it's like a most badass shooting gallery <laughs> Yeah, so you can – this really tripped me out because it was – the VR thing, I know it's like a video game, so it changes what it shows you based on what you're up to. And But the the way that the mocap worked on the stormtroopers that were firing at you and like the way that they – how they made them look like when they fell and when they were shooting you or when they got hit, like watching them take the damage, it really tripped me out. Because it looked like stunt people responding to me fake shooting at them. Yeah, well, I mean, they they the cool thing is that they do respond to you shooting. So yeah. there was two up on a platform that nobody was shooting at because there were kind of like two main platforms with a little bridge going through the thing. So the first stormtroopers came out on, I think, the right side, and none of us were paying attention to the left side. And I saw, I was like, oh, man, there's more up on the left side. So I turned, and I shot at it, and it hit the the – little railing in front of them and they both ducked down and it was like whoa like they They totally responded responded to my shooting at them yep like and then the other cool thing is you're wearing a a haptic suit so the vest that you have on you think it's just like to hold the computer but there's really all these sensors in it so when you get a shot you actually feel it Mm -hmm. and it's pretty cool you don't take any damage so there's no way for you to like run out of health or anything but when a shot comes through, like, it scares you. Yeah. Because you feel the zap of uh-huh. it, like, hitting your armor. And then, so I was crouched down, like, doing the, the only thing that I have to reference is paintball. So it was, like, hiding behind a bunker, kneeled down, reaching out, and shooting like you're playing speedball. Yeah. So I did that, but I didn't quite get the gun out past the wall, and I shot the wall next to me. And it made a really loud pop sound and it like sizzled and it scared the crap out of me. And I was like, hey, the wall knows that I shot it. And so I shot it again <laughs> just to see what would happen. And it left these big old blast marks in it and like little sparks flew out. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's not just, you know, the characters taking damage. The atmosphere around me is taking damage, too. Yeah, like everything does. It's it was, so cool. It really made it a, a, a real experience. Yeah. So once all the stormtroopers, and I imagine they threw in those little lava worm things. And this whole time, by the way, K2SO is trying to open a door for you. So you're mm-hmm. stuck on this platform. You can't go anywhere until and he un- gets that door unlocked. Yeah. So that's he, why you're in like this environment. Like you can't just leave it. You um, have to wait for him to do the thing. And he's also yeah. making fun Which of you. Which is like a, a classic, a classic first person shooter scenario in, yeah. a, in a video game. Like yeah. you're hacking a computer and you have to be within like a certain radius of the computer to keep it hacking Mm -hmm. and while you're being attacked and stuff like that so it's it's like a you know perfect normal video game scenario there um but the cool the other cool thing that happens is then after that you kind of go into another room and it sort of becomes like a mini escape room and there's a door they have to unlock but in order to unlock it you have to help k2so with the code so he uh there's the other part of your team so there's a secondary team in there with you but it's not it's it's characters from the star wars universe they're trying to do something else they're like basically the the distraction to help you sneak in i guess so they're on the other side of the glass and they're interacting with you and so the there's like a code that comes on so as they hit the buttons it's like a simon says kind of thing so there's all these colored buttons in front of you and the code comes across and you have to match the color buttons just like Simon says. And it actually went on for a long time. How long was the longest sequence you had to remember? The longest sequence I want to say was seven. Wow. See, I didn't catch much of that because the door opened behind us and we started taking fire. Yeah, so the other two people that were in our group were doing the buttons at first. And then once we started taking fire, they just left. And then I was like, well, I guess I'll do the buttons. <laughs> and so then I started doing – I did like the last three puzzles. Um, and then the door finally – we finally got the door open. But then that's where the real shit happens. Mm-hmm. Now you're in a room. You're on another platform. There's lava between you. And you find the cargo container. 
it's down below on like a flat and like we found the container and it's awesome. They're trying to scan it to figure out what it is. And Darth Vader comes out and he's pissed. Mm-hmm. Dun, 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 and then the cool dun, thing is, dun, dun, is if you try to shoot him again, he reacts and he takes his lightsaber and shoots the light, shoots the laser blast back at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then your your blaster, doesn't it become disabled for a second because he disables it? Yeah, he uses the force and disables it. Yeah. Um, and... And everything that you fire, he does the the reflect thing and it comes back at you. Yeah. And so, so you, you're there, getting you fired by like, your own no, blaster. I've tried so hard to fire so fast and it just reacted so well. Yeah. Like, I was just blasting the shit out of him. And he was like, beep, 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 beep. And I was like, like it was shit, nothing. man. It was like that auto block. <laughs> yeah. It's like, meh, you're not getting through to that guy. Uh-huh. Um, and then, I don't know, do you want to spoil what happens now? Uh, hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. So then you're about to get your ass kicked by Darth Vader. He's coming across, and he has, like, one of those little floaty platforms, and he's coming to get you, and he's getting closer and closer, and, the, you know, Darth Vader's, like, what, 6'6", six, six, something like that? Big dude. He's a big boy in yeah. that animation. Well, in real life, he was like 6'6", six, six or something like that. Was the he dude, really that tall? Yeah, the dude that played him in the movies is like gigantic. Neat. Um, that's why they picked him. I thought I big. I always attributed that to camera trickery. No, he was really like a big dude. Nice. Um, so he's, he gets like right close, I mean super close to you. And then K2SO just flies the the transport through the <laughs> through the wall <laughs> And smashes into Darth Vader, and Darth Vader goes flying, and then you, you jump onto the trans, the transporter, and and fly away. Yep, and you get to fly away in the same sort of fashion that you flew in. Yeah, but it it kind of ties everything together nicely because like you know mission accomplished, and you've got the little droid there, and the only reason he put him they put him there was so that you can reach out and touch him mm-hmm. and be like, oh my gosh, he's like he's yeah. cold, he's actually there. Mm-hmm. That was super cool. It was so beautiful. I think this was – this wasn't my first VR experience because the one at Knott's I think was my first official yeah. VR experience. This was definitely more robust than that. Mm-hmm. I've done – I want to say like four. Four, five. I've done a few because usually at Scarily in Midsummer you are too busy. But I'll usually sneak out and try to find something VR-ish or cool to do at those conventions. <laughs> I wish I could. Um, but usually there's a wait. So sometimes I'll, I'll talk to them, the guys at the booth, and be like, I really want to try it, but I have, like, shows to do. Can I come, like, at this time? And, like, I'll try to schedule a time to mm-hmm. go so they know I'm going to show up, and then they'll just put me in front of the line. Nice. Yeah. It's amazing what you get when you just ask. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was The Void. It was beautiful. Get the souvenir photo. Yeah. It's fun to have. They'll also send you a digital version. If you are given their email address, then they'll send it to you. And then you can put it up on like uh, all the different social media platforms. That's how yes. we did ours. Um, yeah, it's super cool. Uh, I do think for the time, the amount of time that you're in there, so the whole experience is maybe 30 minutes, but your actual VR time is maybe 10 to 15 15 minutes sounds about right. Yeah. It and felt like it went by in a heartbeat, but yeah. I'm sure we were there for quite a... So I think for the price, because it's 30... I want to say it's $35 a person. Yeah. I would want it to be about the VR portion. For that price, probably about 10 to 15 minutes longer. I definitely didn't feel like I was done. Yeah, like when I we wanted done. to keep going. I was, I like, was hoping the story was going to have that W where... You, you know, you start here, you have your conflict, you solve the conflict and you think you're done, but then more stuff happens. And I was hoping for that more that, stuff happens yeah. part and then solving a problem again. Mm-hmm. But we didn't get to that second part. It was just that one problem we needed to solve. We solved it and then it was done. But I'm sure for as far as flow through, that was, it's just what they had to do. Yeah. Totally I definitely worth it. recommend it. Definitely recommend it. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of fun. And I don't even think you need to be a Star Wars fan to enjoy the experience. No, no, I don't think so. Because the story itself is really good. And just the... there. I mean, I know people that have done it that they don't even like video games and they enjoyed the hell out of it. So 
you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it, it has a lot to offer just story wise and interactive wise and, and all this stuff. It's, it's definitely something that you can't really experience anywhere else yet. Like not even in your own home, if you have a VR system yourself, mm-hmm. the <laughs> only thing you can do at home really now is tethered and, and small location based stuff. Like you can't map your entire house and run around your house. Yeah. So how you know, cool would that be though? If you can run up and down the hallway, you're going to be able to eventually. You just walk through your home. Yeah, because like the the uh, was it HTC Vive? They use these things called lighthouses, and it's like a little spinning laser, mm-hmm. and it maps the room. So each room, like when you get it, you get two of them. You put them in opposite corners, and it can map your entire room. So it knows where the walls are, where the furniture is. And if you get too close to one, it adds like a little ghost Tron thing mm-hmm. in the virtual reality environment. So you know you're close to something. Yeah. Um, they There has been people um, that have taken multiple lighthouses and they were able to map a couple rooms. Um, but this, the, it was like hacked together. Like the system is really only designed to do two currently. So they had to like really hack the system and it was a lot of pain to get it set up (laughs) but they were able to do it um but it's also not cost effective because those lighthouses are really expensive yeah you buy it outside the kit um but i think eventually we're gonna see home kits where you can map your entire house maybe even just by um taking the headset and walking around yeah and then it would remember you know the environment because they have there's a the new Windows Mixed Reality headsets that are coming out, which I think there there's three of them out currently. They don't have any tracking. They do what's called inside out tracking. So like, whereas the HTC Vive is outside in, it has the lighthouses outside, and it it has LED infrared LEDs on the headset, and those lasers react to those infrared LEDs to tell mm. to let it know where you are in the space. Outside in tracking means that all they've done is taken uh, computer computer vision cameras, so like what Tesla uses for their autopilot mm-hmm. system, um, and they've put them on multiple places on the headset, and so there's no there's nothing. All the stuff is done internal, so all so those little cameras while you're playing are looking at your environment and can tell where you are oh. in in your room. Neat. Yeah. Is there an advantage to one over the other? Um, there's advantages and pros and cons to both. So the lighthouses, you obviously have to rig wires everywhere around your house because wherever you put it has to be wired into the computer. Oh. So the, you have to run wires everywhere to set it up and it's kind of a pain to set up. Um, but once it's set up, it's really, really accurate. Um, but then again, if you want to take it to a friend's house, you got to spend 40 <laughs> minutes tearing it apart, 40 minutes setting it up at your friend's house. Yeah. The outside in tracking it's super easy. You don't have to do anything. You put the headset on, it's ready to go. But it's not as accurate. Neat. Yeah. That's cool. So, yeah, that was The Void. It was really neat. I hope they do more things like that with all of the franchises. Every one of them. Just lay it on us. I think it's it's a level up as far as experiencing a new level of involvement as the as the audience. Yeah. To get to play that game with them and get into their world and see it. Super awesome. Way more than just a video game. Like the one at Knott's was a video game. And it was fun and immersive and it totally got you into it. But you really felt like you were playing a video game. Yeah. With the graphics and everything. Like you weren't invested in any characters, all that stuff. But with this one, you were walking into a world that was already established. And they had goals and they had conflicts and characters and you just instantly cared. Well, and it's a... It's a universe, assuming that you like Star Wars or have at least seen the most recent two Star Wars, it was a universe that you know. Yeah. So you had, there's an instant connection there. You know, they could have done it on some, you know, one-off story that they created themselves and it still would have been really, really cool. Uh, But I don't know if there had been as much of an emotional investment into the story. Yeah. Um. Right now, the void also. I think it's in currently in New York City, but it travels around. They have a Ghostbusters um, one, which it, maybe that one will come as an extra add-on to the uh, one in Anaheim. 
Because I heard that that eventually they're going to have multiple things you can do. Yeah. So you can go and kind of pick what what you want. So maybe the Ghostbusters one will come. I heard it's really cool. Um, Same basic idea where you get the the backpack and your backpack is Yeah, but it's probably more like a proton pack. Yeah. You get your proton pack on. And you got your your ghost zapper gun. (laughs) Yeah. so I think that's going to be it. Uh, let's talk about Haunted House stuff. Um, uh, All Saints Lunatic Asylum up in Apple Valley is going to do this year once again their Easter egg hunt. That's coming up, so go to their website. You know, you can Google them. I don't know exactly what their website is, but you can Google them, and they're going to do the Easter egg hunt. The way it works is you go through the Haunted House and the demented evil Easter Bunny is hunting you down, but you have to find eggs and i guess certain eggs have prizes in them and if you find the eggs with prizes you get whatever the prize is oh cool yeah so that it's <coughs> like a legit easter egg hunt through a haunted house it's an easter egg hunt yeah oh how cool are they um, the ones that did the valentine's day thing yeah so they're the ones that did the valentine's day thing i think this is their second time doing the easter egg thing good for them so they're yeah they're, they're, they're yeah they're getting into it they're doing some stuff maybe they'll do the uh the St. Patrick's Day one, too, again. <laughs> um, well, that'll come sooner than the Easter one, wouldn't it? That, um, yeah, I think, yeah, because Easter's in April, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, um, shit, what's the one in Thousand Oaks? Uh, Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror is opening up, so you can go to their website. They're going to be open for one or two days as a charity event. Um, to help support, I believe, the fire victims or the landslide victims, uh, something like that. So oh, cool. you can go to their website. All the proceeds are going to go to that charity that they picked. Um, and I think, is it just one day? It may be, I think it's just one day, one night they're, they're opening. Um, but that's coming up pretty soon. So go and check their website, Reign of Terror, um, or their Facebook page. They have all the info for the event on there. Um... I think is there anything else going on there's uh god there was another one that somebody sent me and now I don't remember what it was because my phone's in the room (laughs) (laughs) well I'll post about the other one um I think that's it you have anything else going on um I don't have anything going on but I did want to uh shout out to our amazing hero and leader (laughs) Kevin Smith, I'm sure he'd hate being considered a leader, but um, I'm sure everyone who listens to this probably listens to his stuff and listens to Ralph Garman and all those guys, but um, Kevin Smith had a heart attack on Sunday night, and he's alive, he is getting better, it went as good as it possibly can go, but... He was in the right place with the right people who made the right call at the right time, and they got him to the hospital exactly, you know, in the amount of time to save his life. Yeah, the doctors worked their magic, but it... It mattered a lot to me because the reason that like this podcast exists, the reason that we cre- we've created any of the content that we have is because of the message that he preaches. Yeah. And it's to, if it's the, why not? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the bottom line. Like I want to do a thing. Why not? Just yeah. go do it. You know, if you want to, if you want to act, but you can't find anyone to cast you, you make your own thing. If you want to see something exist and it doesn't yet, then you're the one where it's your job to do it. Yeah. And so he is a, a, a really big, you know, mentor of mine. Yeah. He's a big, uh, hero and mentor of mine too. Like, um, you know, just even, so one of the most inspiring things to me was, uh, Tusk, yeah. you know, cause I was there at the very beginning. Right. So I don't know if anybody has seen Tusk or know the story of how it all came out, but, he uh, has, on a Smodcast show, him and his friend uh, read this article that was in Europe about this guy who was looking for a roommate. And and it was just a total joke that this guy wrote this story. But he, he was like, I'm an XC captain and I was marooned <laughs> on this island and I fell in love with this walrus. We were best friends and he's what kept me alive the whole time I was on this island until I got rescued. And so I want a roommate that's willing to occasionally dress up in a walrus costume for me just so I can feel like I'm there with my friend. And and so they read this story and uh, they obviously like it was a total ridiculous joke. But then 
they started brainstorming together. Well, what if it was actually a horror movie? And what if this? And what if that? And what if that? And and eventually, the like you know, it kept coming up every podcast after that, and you could tell <laughs> that he was just like stuck on it. And then he's just like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna make it," and he made it. And it's just like, it's just ridiculous. Like you, you know, if you want something to be made, you just have to decide, "I'm gonna make it," mm-hmm. and then it's gonna happen. Like. You know, you just have to have faith that you you can do it and just work hard at it and it'll work. And it'll not work give out. up. Because there's yeah. going to be plenty of stuff that isn't sexy. You know, like so many parts about making a thing, whatever it is that you're making, is boring. And it feels like it kind of sucks away that creativity because you have all these hoops to jump through. You've got red tape to deal with. You know, lots of things need to go right in order for something to happen. And... In all of that, it's easy to go, you know what? This isn't as fun as I thought. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. But then if you do stick with it, you get to stick around for the fun stuff that makes all that stuff worth it. And then you see the finished product and you go, that's why we put up with it. Yeah. That's why we we bothered. And it could be something that means nothing to anybody else, but it matters to you. And that's, that's the only reason to make something is because you want to do it. You want to see the fruit of that labor, whatever it is. And, you know, if that's, if there is a takeaway to be had, it is, if you really want to do something, please do it. You know, as long as you're not hurting yourself or anybody else or breaking the law in some way, like you never know when you're going to punch your ticket. Yep. We felt that in October, you know, we, I felt that last January, like we feel it all the time. And this was one of those things where it wasn't too late. And as this man, especially he, you know, no regrets. If that was his last day, he stated that, you know, he would have been proud of what he had done, but I'm not entirely sure if my ticket were to be punched, if I would be proud yet. There are a lot of things that I keep saying I want to do. Haven't done them yet. There are a lot of things I have done and a lot of things that I have that I'm super grateful for. And in that regard, yes, I would be content if life, if that life candle went out, I would be satisfied in that way. But I know that there's stuff that I put off or I have excuses to why I haven't done them. And they might be valid excuses, but they are excuses and that thing's not done. Uh And, you know, that maybe it's a little bit of a realignment for anybody to just be like, if there's a thing you really want to do, it doesn't matter how old you are. You're not too old to start something new. You're not too old to make something. In fact, your age might be an asset, you know. It's not the world's not filled with only 20 year olds with stars in their eyes. Yes. Some of us are 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, why not? It's so, never too late to do the thing. Never. So yeah. Salud, Kevin Smith, get better. Yep. Get better, buddy. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I wanted to make sure that would touched upon. Yeah. All good things from here on out. Yes. Yeah. And, um, I guess that's it. Are you done? Yeah. All right. Let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> we live here. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm out of here. Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Bye. <laughs> I'm going to eat the rest fo- of that pizza in the fridge. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook at Tales from the Fog, Instagram at Tales from the Fog. You can follow Veronica on Instagram Ver- at Veronica Voices. And, uh, be sure to follow Decay Brigade at Decay Brigade Official on all the things. Mm-hmm. Um, there's probably going to be video eventually coming out uh, with the show that we just did this last Friday for the school, but uh, probably going to be a ways off. Probably actually would not be till close to the conventions in July and August. Possibly. The thing <clears throat> is we had like a legitimate camera crew come in <laughs> and having legitimate footage means that it's going to take legitimate editing time to get yeah, it done. So it could take some and time. Stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, man. So, all right, guys. Uh, um, till next time. See you in the fog. Bye, guys. Bye.